Hello, everyone, and welcome to SCORE Fairfield County's live webinar on software development and implementations for startups, avoiding pitfalls. I'm Tim Ryan, the webinar coordinator and a business mentor here at SCORE Fairfield County, and I'll be your host. Our presenter today is Matt Krieger. More on Matt in just a minute. First, some brief inf information on SCORE. There's over 320 offices and 11,000 volunteers nationwide. We're part of the Small Business Administration. SCORE Fairfield County has 130 volunteers with a wide range of industry process and subject matter expertise. We offer three primary value-added services to small business owners. One, free one-on-one -on -one counseling. Two, educational workshops and webinars, over 150 per year and three extensive resources on our website, including Word and Excel templates to help you build your business plan. Some useful information about today's event. If you have a question, please use the chat window at any time during the presentation. It is located in the lower part of your screen. Our webinar will end at noon to respect your time. The session is being recorded and the link to the recording will be available on our website within the next couple of days. Now our speaker. Matt Krieger is a technologist and executive with experience in IT manufacturing, nonprofit and publishing. He is president of COBER and has held senior IT leadership roles. Matt is CTO of the SCORE Fairfield County chapter and is on the SCSU uh, Com Computer Science Tech Advisory Board. Matt is chair of the Reader's Digest Partners for Site Foundation and is an advisor for cyber seniors. He frequently presents on topics of business and technology. Matt is founder of Whisper, a service allowing consumption of web content as high quality text to speech. Welcome, Matt. I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> the focus of today's presentation is about <clears throat> managing risk and optimizing for opportunity when you as <clears throat> business entrepreneurs have to develop software or do software implementations for your business. While not exclusively focused on this, there is a strong focus in this presentation on advice for those who need to develop technology solutions specifically in support of their product or service delivery. So those of you who need to develop apps or websites or services. I do cover back office software um, development a bit, but again, the focus is on um, developing software for, for your customers. Software development fundamentally is, is a risky business. Um, it, it is risky, it is not cheap, and once you start, you're always developing. Uh, software is, is not static. Um, we're gonna cover the risks, as I said, uh, and how to avoid some of those risks and think about some of the questions to ask. So we're gonna cover things like, uh, uh, how can you get from A to B? Do you really need an app? Um, do, you, do you need to be able to handle large numbers of users from the beginning? Uh, where does security fit in? How do I manage a development team? Um, what technology should I use? Does it matter which cloud provider I use? Do I build it or do I buy it? We're gonna talk about those things today. So one of the, one of the traps that I find entrepreneur, and, and, and by the way, let me, let me characterize for a moment what I think is, is sort of a typical uh, entrepreneur that, that, that we run into at SCORE. The typical entrepreneur that we run into is appropriately so 100% focused on their business and their product, and they are an expert in their market. They are not technology experts and they're not software experts and they shouldn't have to be. Um, so that's kind of the typical profile of, of an entrepreneur that this presentation is, is focused on. One of the traps that I find entrepreneurs fall into is they come up with an idea 
and immediately they want to make that app. And that's problematic, and it's problematic for several reasons. Number one, why do they want the app? They don't have customers yet. They may not even have beta users yet. They haven't defined the requirements. So deciding that you need an app right out of the gate typically is something that is, is a risky type of assumption. If you want to demonstrate your concepts uh, and your product, there's so many ways to do that with relevant testers and, and, and stakeholders than an app. There's sketches on a piece of paper. There's tools that allow you to pilot uh, and prototype your app. There's sketch tools. You can use physical cards and piece of paper, pieces of paper. My point here is that, and we're going to talk about this later, developing apps, developing websites is an expensive proposition. You shouldn't do it until you need to do it. And a lot of the entrepreneurs that we meet, they're in the stage where they're coming up with the product concept. They're coming up with the idea. They're figuring out their target audience. And they need critical feedback and validation from that audience in order for them to make informed product development decisions. Summary advice here is don't necessarily think that you need to develop that app or that website in order to get that feedback. There's many creative, low-tech, cheap ways to accomplish that same thing. As I said, sketching on pieces of paper, using prototype tools, and so on and so forth. This is one of the first questions that typically comes from an entrepreneur. Um, and I, I tend to push back on this type of question. Um, oftentimes, because the question comes too early. So I urge entrepreneurs, um, don't ask this question until you've validated your product and validated your market. But let's assume for now that you've done that. Um, the question about choosing the right technologies is probably still not the exact right question to ask. If you're not a technology expert, the better question to ask is, who's the right partner? for me to work with? Who's the right team? Who do I trust? Um, what does my audience need? So the question about technologies is, is often one that doesn't matter either. Um, there are so many technologies and there's lots of religious and political wars about which technologies are better or faster. And often it just doesn't matter. Um, because all the technologies, or many of them, will, will do the job. So the question ultimately about what the right technology is, is who's going to be developing the technology? Who's going to be developing the solution? Uh, if you have a competent team that you're going to work with, well, often they will specify the technology. Um, you're going to go where the talent is. You're also going to go where the users are. You have some basic questions. If you need to target iPhone people or Android people, uh, versus one or the other, or maybe you don't need to target mobile people at all, maybe just web and not native apps. Uh, uh, that, that is a determiner. There are many entrepreneurs who say, uh, you know, who, who wish to target certain audiences that primarily have Android phones. That sort of suggests a certain type of technologies. Same thing for, for iOS. But again, the, the question that you really should be asking is, is who's going to be my partner? Uh, and what and what technologies do they use? The other important thing here is you want to be minimizing what you actually build and reuse technologies that exist already to the extent possible. Twenty years ago, or more, ten years ago, even when you needed to create software, you would sit down and you would create that software from scratch. Today, lots of building blocks, lots of pieces are available as modules that you don't have to build at all. Uh, every app needs to send an email or a notification. I can pay for a service that sends notifications. Uh, every uh, application needs to authenticate you with the username and password. I can get 
free or cheap software that does that already and does it well. Um, many applications uh, uh, need to upload and download files. Well, there's services that do that. I don't have to build any of those things. I can use open source libraries. I can use third-party services that are available. And instead of spending my time building software, I spend my time integrating. I spend my time gluing pieces together rather than building them from scratch. So uh, th those are a couple suggestions. If you look at your requirements today, there is more than likely a service out there which accomplishes some piece of it. Language translation, spell check, voice recognition, image upload and download, image recognition, authentication, maps and location. All of these services are something that are available today, either free with open source or cheaply on monthly subscription services. So I focus you, I, I urge you to uh, uh, glue together pieces as opposed to uh, build them from scratch. You still need to have technology choices there. There's many, many options for all of these things. But again, the answer for those is gonna largely depend on who your partners are in the process. One important point uh, I wanna make that I didn't cover is, is the second bullet. Maybe counterintuitive, but my point here is uh, it may not matter because if you're successful, you'll throw it out anyway. What does that mean? Why would I throw something out if I'm successful? Well, what happens is if you are unsuccessful, you certainly will throw out what you've done. If you are successful, you probably will learn enough to suggest that you maybe need a different direction. Many, many technology projects start as one thing. And after you get user feedback, you realize that you need a different solution entirely, or the current solution wasn't sufficient, or it didn't grow rapidly enough. Whether you succeed or fail initially, you're going to throw out what you've done and probably build new. If you look at Uber, so Uber, the company, I don't know how long have they been around, 10 years, maybe 12, I'm not sure. When Uber started, they developed uh, uh, some software to help their uh, drivers locate the potential passengers. Um, I read a story about this. They built that software. It was, it was uh, sort of held together with shoe, st uh, uh, shoe string and bubble gum. Um, I probably have the two wrong materials there, but you get my point. They built it. They got some growth in the system. They threw it out. They had to redo it because they had to get something more appropriate. They had a lot more growth. The software couldn't grow with them. They had to throw it out and they built it again. And today it's this massive thing, but it went through many, many iterations. And if you're successful, you're likely to have that same situation. One of the questions that comes up very frequently in, in software is do you buy or do you build? So what do I, what do I mean by that? Well, Here's a very extreme example. If I need a spreadsheet, I'm certainly not going to build a new spreadsheet. I'm going to use Excel or I'm going to use Google Sheets. Okay, that's, that's an obvious example. But it's not so obvious when you need to build software custom for your business. Unfortunately, one of the traps that both entrepreneurs and people who develop software fall into is they think that their requirements are so unique that nothing exists that satisfies those requirements and they go and build something from scratch. Well, that's a problem. You're reinventing the wheel. You're solving problems that have been solved. You're extending your development time. Uh, you're spending lots more money. That's not good. You wanna try to reuse pieces to the extent possible. When you build a house today, you don't, harvest your own wood, you buy wood that's already cut in the shape that you want. You buy reusable pieces, right? All manufacturing today is essentially based on uh, uh, replaceable parts and reusable pieces. Everybody, in my opinion, when you develop software, you should have a strong bias for buying as many pieces and modules as you can and reusing things that already exist as opposed to building new. 
I go back to the example I gave in the last slide of modules. When you need a module that helps somebody log on, well, you don't need to build that, that's been built. When you need a module that takes photos, well, that's already been built. When you need a module to um, locate your location on the map, that's already been built. The only things you should be building are the things that are truly specific to your business. You're not as unique as you think when it comes to the software implementation. This is another place where cloud fits in. When you look at the cloud today, when you look at the major cloud providers, Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, Google, cloud is, is, is based on this notion of you're renting somebody else's resources rather than building them yourself. Um, you don't host your own website anymore. You, you put it in the cloud. You don't uh, uh, gener have your own email server. You put it in the cloud and you pay a small monthly fee. And that's the way cloud services today have evolved. If you look at almost any company today with a technology infrastructure that works, almost all of the time they are reusing existing technologies and gluing them together to build their solution. And they're only doing custom development again where they have very, very unique requirements. So one of the benefits of cloud is that all of this infrastructure exists and all of these services exist. When I need to send emails to my users, I don't need to build that myself. I can use MailChimp. I can use Microsoft Azure's messaging services. I can use database services in the cloud. All of these pieces of infrastructure exist for a monthly fee and they allow you to use them without building the software or the service yourself. Finally, when this gets back to the, to the notion of considering yourself unique, it's probably a good idea in, in many cases to bend your operations to how the software works than the other way around. You'll say, wait a minute, I have special requirements. Well, you do, and you should certainly respect them. But you should also think about how software builds in best practices. Um, when you use accounting software like QuickBooks, you're not just buying accounting software or renting accounting software. You are taking advantage of a business process for how to do uh, uh, double entry accounting that's existed for many, many years and that will enforce those, those rules. Uh, you don't make up accounting practices. You use the accounting practices that are in the software. Uh, and I recommend that bias in general, which is use the best practices and only diverge from them when you have a very special requirement. Okay, let's, we've now gotten past those things. And we have the question of how do I actually go get my thing developed? I have to make an app. I have to make a website. How do I do that? This is a point where so many entrepreneurs get stuck. Many, many never get past this point. It is a very, very hard problem. One of the biggest challenges is when there is a solo entrepreneur who is not a technologist and they need to get something built. Very, very challenging. They typically don't have the, the vocabulary uh, around what they need, around how to do it. So they hire a development team, uh, translating requirements between the entrepreneur and the development team is very, very hard. Uh, many of us have experienced this even when working with contractors in our own homes doing things. You can see how the conversations, people can get out of sync and costs can, can spiral. It's very important that you get a partner on the technology side. What does a partner mean? You need somebody you trust who's going to be your advocate, who's gonna translate your business requirements into technology requirements. Somebody who can uh, uh, challenge the software development folks and call BS on them when they're pitching something to you that let's say is more than you need. Um, someone that knows the balance between what you technical requirements are and what the right technical solution is 
for that requirement. Um, ideally, that is a person who's on your team. Ideally, you have a technical co-founder, someone who is joined at the hip with you, who speaks the language of technology and understands your business and can be your advocate there. In many, many cases, that is just not practical to do uh, because it's a full-time position. I mean, you, you need to literally be joined at the hip with this individual. So many, many entrepreneurs don't have that person or they can't find that person or they can't pay that person. And there's no equity arrangement that makes sense. So what's the next thing that you do? Well, you could find a friend who speaks the language of technology and software development and sort of use them as the, as the intermediary. That's also hard. They're not working with you part time, full time. They don't necessarily have skin in the game. It's your project, it's not theirs. There's no magic bullet solution to this problem. But I will tell you that in my experience, the difference between software development projects that succeed and fail are where you have a partner uh, who, can, who can be your, your advocate in this case. Um, this also is, is impactful. Should you ever go for investment? Uh, investors want to see that you have a path to success and non-technical founders developing technology products have a massive, massive track record of, of failure. So solving this problem and there's no easy solution, I think is critical in order for you to get credibility. Um, this, by the way, is a challenge that just having a lot of money doesn't solve. If you have a lot of money, uh, but you don't have the vocabulary of managing software projects, well, you'll just be giving away that money to the, to the developers. This isn't to say developers are dishonest people by any, by any stretch, but you will be lacking something in the translation that will cause the, the, the costs and the, and the time to, to, uh, to spiral. So at the end of the day, you need somebody you trust in order to help bridge this gap. We had a question in the chat. Well, what about a SCORE volunteer uh, mentoring you? Could they help in this, in this area? Th they can, sort of. Managing a development team, managing a software project is, while it's not a full-time position by, by necessarily any stretch, it is a very high touch position. The, Interface with the technology team needs to be continuous. It needs to be ongoing. They need to know the, the, the technology relationship person needs to know what's in your mind, what's in the team's mind. It's, it's something much deeper than I think SCORE is set up to provide um, because it's not a mentoring relationship. It's work. It, this, this technology individual is actually doing work for you, for your product, uh, and it's not mentoring. So mentoring can help, but it, it's, it's not the answer. So unfortunately, I don't have a solution there, but I do wanna make you aware of the risk. Many folks, um, uh, there are options, by the way, as a, as a founder, you can go to uh, uh, meet and greets where you'll, you'll look for potential technology co-founders. Uh, if you Google for find a technology co-founder, um, you, you, uh, you'll, you'll see resources. There's, there's also boot camps and other places you can go to meet those types of people. Um, in any case, where, where can you go get technical labor at all? Uh, I recommend, uh, first of all, you're going to have to decide what you can afford and where. Um, very often, the, uh, you know, U.S. labor rates are, of course, very expensive compared to other locations. So you, you may be looking at offshore development. I recommend looking at labor marketplaces like um, Upwork. So Upwork.com. Think of Upwork for uh, contract labor like eBay is for products. They are, it's a labor marketplace. There are freelancers all over the world with ratings and reviews and hourly rates and you can chat with them and talk with them and optionally hire them to do your work. And I use resources like this all of the time. Now I have the advantage that I speak the language of technology. So that's easier for me. Um, uh, 
but that these labor marketplaces can get you designers, they can get you uh, technology people, they can get you uh, uh, administrative people, anything you want. So those labor marketplaces are, are important. Um, I certainly recommend do as little as you can in order to get the best bang for the buck. I recommend iterating quickly in, in small steps. What do I mean there? Um, many people get caught in the trap of they build the entire solution uh, over a year only to find that when they go to market, it's too late, it's wrong, it's not, it's not relevant anymore. Um, iterate quickly in small steps in response to what your users tell you, I find is, is a, uh, a meaningful way to go. And the ecosystem supports this kind of thing today. You know, uh, every other day your apps get updates. That's because those development teams are, are developing, um, um, inter, you know, quickly. Tim, somebody had their hand up. I don't know if, do you, do you want to cue that question for later or, or, or how do we do that? You can take that now if you want. Uh, just have them type it in the uh, chat window or, or the Q&A section, either one. Yeah, okay, so whoever had their hand up, if, if you wanna do that in the chat, that, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna answer one more question in the chat that I saw. Uh, how would the iteration work when the contract with the development team has a start and end date? My recommendation there is you as the entrepreneur with your technology partner <clears throat> need to really define very crisply the what you want and break it up into as many small pieces as you can. Um, you don't say to somebody, build me a kitchen. You say, uh, I want this countertop and I want this kind of cabinets and I want this kind of paint and I want this kind of feeling and I want this kind of sunlight. And, <clears throat> and, and you can do it in phases and you can manage the steps as opposed to one big chunk. You don't go to a website person and say, build me a website. All right, that doesn't mean anything. You, you, can, you can build um, a page at a time. You can build one piece of functionality. You can add uh, e-commerce later. You can add other designs later. Break the project down into small steps and put start and end dates for, for everything. And these labor marketplaces support this type of work, this behavior, and allow you to chunk up large projects into more meaningful, uh, smaller segments rather. Okay, important, important question here. <clears throat> what do I do for my initial implementation? There's a term which is kind of a bit buzzwordy, uh, but it's very relevant. It's called minimum viable product MVP. Minimum viable product means that whatever you put out initially for your uh, uh, software, it should be the minimum possible that does the job in order for you to get meaningful feedback to develop your product and address your customer concerns and then move to the next step. Very, very important. I work with entrepreneurs all the time and they're very excited and they say, I, I have to make this piece of software. And I say, well, what does it need to do? And they say, it needs to do everything I need it to do. And I say, no, it, it, it doesn't need to do everything you need it to do. You should think about the few things you need it to do in order to get solid enough feedback that you now are well informed enough to do more. Uh, I'm working with an entrepreneur who is creating an app. And one of the things that those apps, uh, that the app requires is, is that it tracks a, a route around a location. You're driving, you're biking, and, and you're tracking your, your route. And I think you've probably all seen this in, in various apps. And uh, when, when, you, when she tracks the route, uh, the individual can record audio and photos and video and sort of annotate uh, the route. And one of the things that she wanted to do was, was have the, the user be able to share uh, the, the route details while they're going around with other people. And I said, well, do you really need them to be able to share this thing in the initial implementation? Like, what if you added it later? Oh no, they need to be able to do, it's very important to do. I say, but wait a minute, you haven't established yet that you even have an audience here who's willing to pay attention and use your app. You don't know that they need that, and even if you do know that they need it, maybe you can do it in phase two. You can save yourself money by forcing yourself to think about what is the minimal. And it's a very hard problem. I, I have problem with this myself when I'm developing software because <clears throat> I'm emotionally invested 
I'm excited. I want to do it all at once. And the scope tends to creep. I add more, I add more, I add more. And I have to resist that because getting the minimal done means that you get to market quicker, you get to market cheaper, and you get to market with lower risk. And based on that feedback, you iterate slowly. So whatever minimum means, it's different for everybody. But I urge you to constantly think about the minimum that you need to do and only do that. <clears throat> Security is uh, a big, big topic. Don't need to uh, beat that one to death. Um, but security, it's not obvious to people who are not security folks that security is not something you add. You, you have to build with security in mind. Security in software is a lot more difficult than security in your house. Your house is sort of a static thing. It's there, you have doors and you have windows and you're not adding new doors and new windows and new holes. It's sort of like is what it is. And you, you put in the appropriate protect, you put locks on your doors, you put an alarm, you have a noisy, a, a loud dog, uh, you, 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 know, you, you have a, a gates which trap uh, bad guys. Um, software is a, is a living, breathing thing. Uh, if you look at the news, there's software vulnerabilities every day. You can't sacrifice security. If you sacrifice security, um, you will sacrifice credibility and trust with your audience. You from the start have to have apps which are designed with people's privacy in mind, data security in mind. Uh, you, you want to establish trust. When an app comes out today and it's found out that they're capturing data that wasn't uh, divulged or uh, uh, n uh, sending data that's not encrypted. That's bad news in the press. Uh, I recommend that when you're talking with your technology partner that you make sure that security is built in from the start. And security doesn't just fit into your technology infrastructure. Security is everywhere. I mean, backing up your computer, that's a portion of security. Making sure that you have multiple backups, that's a portion of security. Uh, you, you need to be thinking about security from the point of view of uh, uh, protecting your systems from theft, protecting your systems from, from data loss, protecting people's privacy. Um, I'm not here today to give you the solutions for all those things, but to let you know that when you're talking to software developers, software in, in, uh, uh, integrators, security needs to be at the top of your list and you need to force them to think that way too. One of the, the, the problems I see in, in some entrepreneurs is they worry about scale too early. What do I mean? Uh, the entrepreneur says, my, my application needs to be able to support a thousand users using it at the same time. Well, I'll tell you that building an app to support a thousand users at the same time is a heck of a lot more expensive than building an app to support five at the same time. Okay. It's not uh, 200 times more expensive, but it's a lot more expensive. You should worry about scale when you need to, okay? Not too early. Unless you are exceptionally lucky, you're not going to be an overnight success with your software. There's very few websites and apps that become successful overnight. Of course, those are the only the ones you hear about because that's what the news tells you. But the vast majority of software and the vast majority of apps uh, take a long time to become successful. Like people think Elon Musk was successful overnight. He went through many, many failures before he was successful. That's the same with any people, anybody and, and software as well. When you're focusing on software development, focusing on scale too early is going to cost you a lot of money. So you need to make sure that your first 10 users are taken care of before you worry that you could support a thousand people at once, because that's a whole different level of cost and time and scale. So my recommendation is put off those questions until you need to. Okay. Um, th this is kind of a summary of software development best practices. I give you these 
not because I'm trying to turn you into software developers, but because I want you thinking about these as you work with people who are software developers, okay? Uh, knowing what you want and documenting what you want is the most critical thing. If you can't document what you want, then the developer will be using their imagination instead of doing what you want. That'll cost you time and money and disappointment. You need to be able to document what you want. How do you document what you want? There's a lot of ways to do this, but you need a specification document. The specification document says, what do I want? It could be as simple as there's a button. I click a button. What happens when I hit the button? Many people do this in terms of what they call user stories. A user story is a concept from a, a software development methodology called Agile, uh, which, which talks about iterative development in small steps. A user story puts something in, the, in terms of, of the end user and how they might want something. So the, a user story for the application I told you about that tracks the route says, uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the voice of the user. It says, I want to uh, make a route and take photos during my route, okay? Uh, it might say, I want to take a photo and annotate that photo. The user story might say, uh, I want to buy a widget from your website. So think of a user story as a piece of functionality, but written in the voice of the user. And that is an effective way, one of the effective ways to document to your developers what you need. So if you're putting together a specification or a requirements document, one of the ways to do that for your MVP is to define who are the users of your application? Who are the constituents? Maybe you have a, a, an end user, maybe you have a customer service manager and you, you document on the paper, the user stories associated with each of those roles. And when you work with a developer, you present them those user stories and the developer will ask you questions and it becomes a way to generate a constructive dialogue. So user stories are effective. You can Google that and, uh, and, and, and you can see what I mean. When you're developing, when, when you have a team developing, it's very important that they track every bug and every task and every issue that comes up. The systems and technologies for software teams to be able to track those bugs and those issues are very mature. Everybody should be doing it. If you're working with a development team and you say to them, hey, what are the current list of bugs? And they can't tell you, you're probably working with the wrong team. If you say, well, what tasks are outstanding? If they can't tell you that, you're working with the wrong team. Uh, all the tools that manage software development, there's tools that, that properly version your, your software. There's tools that's, that back it up. All of those mechanisms need to be in place, those best practices. Uh, and good development teams follow them. Uh, uh, good development teams will know how to get back to the previous version of a software revision if the current version breaks. That's called software source control or, or uh, 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 revision management. Those are tools that developers have that differentiate professional developers from amateurs as they take those practices seriously. Um, you have to involve your users in your software development. As I said before, uh, it's pretty risky to spend a year developing software and then present it to your users. They're probably gonna say, what? Uh, what is this? Th this is this represented what I needed a year ago, not now. So you need to involve your users can consistently, iteratively, in small iterations, have them test, take that feedback in, and iterate and iterate back. Most of what will be developed today will be developed for running in the cloud. Even apps have cloud services that sit behind them invisibly. So developing for the cloud is different than developing not for the cloud. And software teams need to know how to do that. They need to know how to reuse those services that I talked about before that exist in the cloud. Today, there's what we call this as a service model, AAS. There's software as a service, SAAS. Platform as a service, PAAS. All of these things refer to services, like I mentioned before, authentication, databases, security, that exist in the cloud as a service that you pay for and essentially rent on a monthly basis. Developers need to have visibility 
uh, in, in, into those things. Um, defining metrics is very, is very important. Um, what do I mean by metrics? Defining how the users use the software, what pieces are being used most, and tracking those things is something very important. I'm actually going to have coverage of this perhaps in the next slide. I'll go into a little more detail. Uh, okay, so let's let's check out this question. How do I choose a cloud a cloud provider? It's sort of the same question as how do I choose the technology? May or may not matter. Um, your cloud provider primarily is going to be a function of two things. The experience and skills of the developers that you're working with and where the services exist that you need to use. Amazon, Microsoft, uh, there's a lot of parity between their services. They both have a lot of things, but they also have some unique things. And you may need some services that only Microsoft has or only Amazon has. Your developers and your technical partner is gonna help you manage that. At the end of the day, uh, should you grow and be successful enough, you'll probably be using a little bit of everything. But just don't overthink it. Don't spend a heck of a lot of time worrying where you're going to be, because in the long run, it, it doesn't matter as much as, as what you do. Uh, I hear entrepreneurs say, I'm worried about being with Microsoft because what if I'm locked into them and I can never move and therefore I'm going to build it for both and protect myself. Well, you're going to spend a lot of money optimizing for a problem that's probably not a, a, a real problem. Those companies aren't going away. Um, and, and so do what you need to do to get that software out quick. Let's talk about metrics for a minute. So I, this is getting back to the other, uh, to the other slide. Um, it's important, like in any business or any business decision, what is that expression? You can't manage it if you can't measure it. You need to build in metrics into your software. How many people are using it? What features are they using? Is it performing fast enough? What actions are the users taking, okay? Reports from users are very important, but they are also anecdotal and they are not always fact-based. What is not fact-based is when the app says it was opened at 10 o'clock and used until 10.05, and then it hit a bug at 10.07 and crashed at 10.08, and that there's five features in the app, but only three of them ever get touched. Those are metrics that you should capture and look at because if you don't know what people are using in your app, you don't know where to put your money. Um, software developers and teams have well-established mechanisms for capturing metrics. Uh, I know that you, when I develop software, I wanna put my time and my money into the areas that matter most. How do I know what matters most? Because I'm measuring where my users are spending time. And if they're not spending time in a feature, I either have to reevaluate that feature to make it something that they will want to use or cut it out or reduce usage of that feature uh, uh, because, it, because it's not meaningful. I also want to know, are my users experiencing performance problems? You know, if it takes 10 seconds for an app to open, you might lose the user's attention. How long does it take to open? How long does it take to do things? All these are metrics that you're going to want to capture. We have a question. Um, from Brianna, how do I know what cloud a vendor is using? Um, you, you don't necessarily, uh, unless, unless you ask. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't know uh, unless you ask. Um, and, and oftentimes it may not matter. I think what's maybe more important is, is that provider using appropriate best practices and do they have the right uh, security and infrastructure? Um, I have a second metric slide. Okay, we talked about this already. Performance, we talked about what features are used. Um, we talked about errors. Okay, I, I covered this one already. Let's talk about costs, uh, a big, big area. First thing about costs is you need to recognize that when you put money into a software development project or any technology development project, you will almost always never stop paying you will never stop making investments. You don't develop software 
for a fixed cost and then never spend money again. It doesn't happen. Every single piece of software today that matters and that is successful is continually tuned, continually developed, continually uh, uh, improved. Security risks and uh, vulnerabilities are continually removed. You never stop paying. Sort of like when you build a house, you don't keep paying to build the house, but you certainly have to maintain it. And the second you stop maintaining your house, it will atrophy. It's the same thing with software. So you need to not have the idea that you have a certain budget and you need to do everything in that budget and then you're done. You'll be paying forever. You just hope that you're going to have income from your paying customers to offset those costs and make money. Um, you're going you're gonna to buy things versus build them. That's, that's a, getting back to another recommendation. Uh, that's how you're going to save money. You're going to know what you want. And you're going to communicate that in a well-documented way with your development team, with your technical partner. Uh, and you're going to iterate in small steps so that you can manage risk. The worst thing is that you, you know, you're, you're, you're driving too far down the road and only find out you're lost when you're 20 miles off track. You need to look every mile. Am I still on track? Am I still on track? Am I still on track? One of the things I recommend is tying your costs to your growth as a service. What I mean there is, excuse me, what I mean there is put the money into the areas that generate revenue. Uh, I run a business, I run a manufacturing business. I want to know that the money we're spending is tied to revenue coming in. Any money I'm spending that is not tied to revenue coming in, sometimes I may need it. I mean, my my, uh, uh, my health insurance is not tied to revenue coming in, but that's sort of a special case. But if I'm doing things that aren't helping generate revenue, I wanna reevaluate them. And so I urge that in, in your software too. Put features, in, put money into features which ultimately gain customers and gain revenue. Get those metrics, use them. Uh, also establish uh, automated alerts on the cost side. So I, I use cloud services a whole lot. I'm constantly getting bills for things I didn't even know I was using. That is just the nature of the cloud. Uh, and because you pay by the minute, by the hour, by the day, the clock is always ticking, even if you're not using something often. So uh, most of the cloud services uh, providers, in fact, all of them, let you put in uh, triggers and alarms that say, uh, if I've spent $100 uh, or more this month, let me know, or stop this service after a certain amount of time uh, or money spent. And those are that's very helpful. Um, the, so in summary, that, that's the presentation. In summary, um, you need a partner. Uh, without a partner on the technology side, I, I just, your chances of success are significantly reduced. Um, Iterating slowly in small steps and focusing on what the customer needs as opposed to the technology is another important recommendation. Realize that you're going to have risk. Uh, you're not building a static thing. You're building a living, breathing thing. That is inherently risky, but you should know that already because running a business, starting a business is inherently risky. Going minimal, the MVP approach, I think is absolutely essential. Uh, prefer buying over building. Uh, make sure the development teams are implementing best practices and measure what you do so that you can, so that you can manage it. Uh, I have a question here in the, in the chat, and then Tim will open it up for other questions. Someone says, related to my earlier question about the importance of having someone I trust on my team, uh, by someone I trust on my team to see what the development team has done after each iteration, is this something a SCORE co-mentor can help me with as I am a non-technical startup? How can a SCORE mentor assist me with developing a website that is government-centric as I am venturing into government contracting business? Okay, so I, I, I think again, let, let, let me answer this question in, in two ways. I'll answer the SCORE specific question. SCORE provides counseling and mentoring, uh, not consulting. So SCORE has subject matter experts who will guide you. They will give you best practices. Uh, they will help you evaluate, uh, uh, you know, they'll, they'll educate you and, and so on. 
the more educated you are, the better you'll do on any project, whether you're educated in the subject matter area, in this case, government contracting, or whether it's we're talking about software uh, uh, development education. The SCORE mentor can, can help with that. Um, in that broad sense, SCORE will help you develop your website, your, your technology product. They will not really be able to be that technical interface to the software development team. It, A, it's not really an appropriate use of SCORE uh, because SCORE is not consulting. Uh, but B, SCORE is typically not staffed that way. So when it comes to the, the actual technology leadership, I think you're going to have to go outside of SCORE. That's not apologizing for SCORE at all. It's, it's simply not what SCORE is designed for. Um, um, but that's where I, I suggest you use some of the resources out there to help find those, uh, those partners. Okay, Matt. Uh, we'll now use the remaining time for questions and answers. We'll uh, take as many as we can till the end of the uh, period. Uh, so please submit them via the chat feature in the lower portion of your screen. As a reminder, recording this webinar is available within a couple of days on our website. Please check our website uh, for information. Matt, what you mentioned about it, finding a partner. How do you find a partner? Uh, what are you looking up in the yellow pages? What's the title or what's the, what are you going for? I think you want to look at um, technology co-founder or um, yeah, startup technology co-founder, uh, technology advisor. By the way, that's another way to do this is uh, if you can find somebody who has the right technology skills, um, not to do the development work, but to interface with that development team and give you that guidance. Uh, if you can give that person equity, sometimes they'll be interested, maybe a percent of equity. Uh, and ownership in your company. So technology advisor, startup technology advisor, uh, technology co-founder, um, Tim, are, are two of the ones I would look for. Okay. Uh, you mentioned Upwork before, and I, I've heard that uh, before. I, as far as I understand it, it's, it's a way of outsourcing some of your, uh, so peop some people have used it for outsourcing like content creation. Uh, they'll actually put a bid out for say, I want a thousand word essay on um, dental health or something and to add to my blog or to my my website and I, I think that's where it, upwork is typically used for right is that outsourcing of uh, yeah upwork up upwork is a is a generalized labor outsourcing marketplace um, I think it is heavy on the technical side in terms of designers and and programmers but it has grown to to encompass um, uh, any type of outsourcing, even uh, uh, administrative or sales or marketing uh, or anything. It's really a freelance uh, marketplace to connect uh, businesses like you with freelancers who, who you wanna work with. Right, right. Uh, and I took on your point, uh, a lot of people do end up asking for things they don't need. I've had people say, well, I've been told I need MailChimp and I ask them how many people are on your list and they'll say they have 20 family and friends on their list. And it's it's like, well, it's too early for them, right? I mean, they need to grow their list before they are really uh, gonna be ready for getting into email marketing, I guess. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, some of these things, Tim, are cheap enough and easy enough to implement, whether you have two email recipients or 20 or 2000, it's sort of no more effort to use the service. I would more, maybe change the example of like a MailChimp to, you know, someone says I need, um, uh, again, you know, uh, support for two, you know, 200 simultaneous users and that costs more money uh, in my app and, and therefore, you know, you know, you can avoid that cost. Some, some services today let you dip your toes in for free or cheap, but I think your point is, is well taken, which is don't, don't incur a cost um, don't optimize prematurely. Wait right. until you have that problem and then and then put that solution in place. Yeah, that made that made me think of my own barber, for instance. Uh, I didn't even know his name. He didn't know my name. But six months ago, when they finally reopened, <clears throat> they had to <clears throat> maintain contact tracing. And so for the first time, he was able to get all the names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses 
of all his all his customers for the contract trace that he had a golden opportunity here to, to build out his email marketing campaign let people know when his prices change or when he's on vacation or whatever just to keep in front of people but that's the type of stuff that you really want to get into we have a question uh, in the chat from glenn <clears throat> what are some good questions to ask when vetting a technology partner <clears throat> or a, a glenn do you mean um well let, let me put it this way if you mean the technology co-founder, the person who's going to be on your team representing you, you're going to know that they have good business acumen. You're going to need to know that they've managed technologies projects uh, and software development projects. You're going to need to know that they have a good balance between your business requirement and technology um, ideals and whiz bangs that you may not need. And, and, and they're going to need to be an expert on you know, how to build often web applications or how to build mobile applications. They should have done it before. Um, you're you're going to want them to have expertise in that. Ideally, that person would also have expertise in your particular business, but you can teach them that. So, so that's not necessarily a requirement. If you mean tech partner, as in like the people who are going to be actually doing the software development, um, <clears throat> th those skills are going to depend on what you and your technology co-founder Define, but certainly the questions to ask the technology partner are, show me what you've done before. Who have you worked with? Prove to me that you have competency. Um, show me your reviews. Uh, 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 pr pr show me that I own the what you create, not you. Um, uh, show me your reputation. Show me your expertise in a given area. I think all of all of those things are 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 very important. Very good. I think that's all we all the time we have uh, for today. Again, SCORE offers free individual counseling. So please uh, go to our website and request uh, a mentor button. Uh, we are available for sessions at this time via phone, email, or video using Zoom. Also, please fill out your evaluations that have been sent at the end of the webinar. On behalf of SCORE, I'd like to thank you all for attending today's SCORE live webinar and closing. A big thanks to Matt Krieger. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.